were birthed in the human conversation, you see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument with science. I mean, we see that you know on the front of, of human health and disease, religion. You know, it used to be that you could get a diagnosis of demonic possession. I mean, you, that was a you know a reasonable thing to believe you had if you were having seizures, say. You know, but now we have a science of neurology and we know about epilepsy. And so when your kid has seizures. You know, you don't go to the church to get get him diagnosed and treated by exorcism, and so that's a good thing. I'm saying that religion is losing the argument on every other front. It's losing the argument ethically. Is it's going to? It will lose the argument spiritually. I mean, we will understand spiritual experience so well at some point at the level of the brain and at the level of uh, the way in which using attention in certain ways can change human experience. We'll understand it in a way that makes a mockery of this kind of de- denominational religion talk about Jesus and grace or about Buddha and magic powers. And, and, and that will break down in the same way that it has broken down on medicine, on the, in medicine. And that's, that's a process I think we just have to be honest about and, and let unfold. intellectual necessity for me to to call a spade a spade I mean to argue against ascendant ignorance you know there's 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 a certain species of ignorance that we call religion that we call faith that is just given a free ride in our society and it's not that it just uh, thrives in a benign way you know it's not like astrology where you know millions of people are into it but nothing really matters Nothing really turns on their astrological beliefs. Um, this is really, I mean, you could not get elected to the to high office in this country without pretending to believe that one of your books was, was authored by the creator of the universe. Um, that, it seems to me, is a problem. And it's, uh, it's a problem, uh, even if we didn't have to worry about the, the conflict that we, we have in the Muslim world, which is explicitly theological, um, uh, even if we, even if uh, our only problem was the role that religion is playing in our society, the way in which it's blocking medical research, the way in which um, it's causing us to debate things like gay marriage as though it was the greatest moral issue of the time. Meanwhile, we have huge problems like global warming and and uh, a variety of emerging conflicts and nuclear proliferation. I mean, we're not spending, uh, we don't spend the same kind of emotional energy on nuclear proliferation. That we spend on abortion and and gay marriage. That is a a uh, really a, a psychotically uh, uh, strange subversion of our of our better interests. I mean, we, you know, we have some real problems in this world that we could creatively solve, and yet we're debating things like gay marriage. That is a legacy of faith. That is a legacy of Christian religion uh, in this case, and and uh, so it's it's something that I, I feel that. Public intellectuals really have to be uh, uh, moved to speak honestly about. Well, I do have existential worries. I mean, I'm, I like I think everybody else uh, am. Concerned about death, you know, it's it's you know, death is in some ways unacceptable. I mean, it's it's just an astonishing fact of our being here that we that we die. But I think worse than that is that if we if we live long enough, we lose everyone we love in this world. I mean, do people die and disappear, and we are we are left with this stark mystery? Uh, there's just, just the sheer not knowing of what happened to them, and into this void. Religion comes rushing with a very consoling story saying nothing happened to them. They're in a better place and you're going to meet up with them after you die. You're going to get everything you want after you die. Death is an illusion. Um, there's no question that that, if you could believe it, that would pay emotional dividends. I mean, there's, not, there's no other story you can tell somebody who's just lost her daughter to cancer, say, to make her feel good. You know, it, it, you know, it, is, it is consoling to believe that the daughter was just taken up with Jesus and everyone's going to be reunited in a few short years. Um, 
there's no replacement for that. There doesn't need to be a replacement for that. I think we have to be, we have to just witness the cost of that. I mean, there are many obvious costs of that way of thinking. Um, one is we just don't teach people how to grieve. You know, I mean, religion is the kind of the antithesis of teaching your children how to grieve. You, you tell your child that, that, you know, grandma's in heaven, uh, and there's nothing to be sad about. Um, that's religion. It would be better to, to equip your child for the reality of this life, which is, you know, we death is death is a fact, and we don't know what happens after death. And I'm not pretending to know that you get a dial tone after death. I don't know what happens after the, the, the physical brain dies. I don't know what the relationship between consciousness and the physical world is. Um, I don't think anyone does know. Now, I think there there are many reasons to be doubtful of naive conceptions about the soul and about this idea that you could just migrate to a, a better place after death. But uh, I simply don't know about what, uh, I don't know what I believe about death. Um, and I don't think it's necessary to know in order to live uh, as sanely and ethically and happily as possible. I don't think you get, um, you don't get anything worth getting by pretending to know things you don't know. I'm not making any strong claims about where science is going. I think it's, it's, it's certainly reasonable to expect that we will understand our experience uh, much better than we do at the level of the brain. And there may, there may be some real impediments to that, but um, it could also be true that the sky is the limit. I mean, we could really understand it uh, in a very precise way, in such a way as to, to allow us to, to alter our experience in, in, um, in as fine a grain a way as we want. Who knows what, what awaits us there? But I know we're not going to get there if we uh, don't have an honest conversation about the roots of human experience. Uh, this whole idea of secular fundamentalism or atheist dogmatism, and this is really a, a play on words. There's, there's nothing that you have to accept uh, as dogma. There's nothing you have to accept on insufficient evidence in order to reject the biblical God or in order to reject the idea that the Quran or the Bible is, is, is the perfect word of God. Um, there's no dogma that you and I have accepted on insufficient evidence in order to reject Zeus and Poseidon and the thousands of dead gods that lie buried in that in that mass grave we call mythology. I mean, these are these are these gods were in good standing among generations of our ancestors, and for a variety of historical reasons, mostly the ascent of, of monotheism, they are now in disrepute. But they have the same epistemological stature as the God of Abraham. I mean, this is not like it's not like there's so much data for the God of Abraham and. There's no data for Poseidon. They're both without data. Um, and it's an accident of history that we are not worshiping Poseidon and, and trying to constrain our um, you know, maritime law at, at, you know, in deference to the whims of the, you know, the god of the ocean. There may be a, there's a value in storytelling. There's a value in, in certainly in art and literature, and, and I think there's a, specifically a value in in narrative, and um, there may be a value in kind of taking on certain mythical propositions as though they as as kind of a schema through which to look at your life. I mean, to, to you know take Joseph Campbell's story of the you know the hero's journey and to think of yourself in those terms and just to look at what uh, features of your your life and psychology that springs into view, um, but I think we have to be very careful ab about making claims to knowledge about the world. I mean, you take something like you know tarot card reading. You know, someone you know, puts the cards down in front of you, uh, and they you know they t turn up you know, whatever it is, the three of rods or whatever a tarot card is, and they say, well, this you know, this suggests to me that um, you're dealing with issues of honesty. Uh, and uh, have you been dishonest with anyone in your life? Um, now, there are two ways to approach a situation. I, I, you know, I think tarot card reading is totally bogus as a metaphysical instrument. I don't think the the card is 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 doing anything important there, except 
it is causing you to ask a question about your life. I mean, somebody is just point blank. A moment ago, you weren't thinking about honesty. And now I've just put this card in front of you and said, well, this tells me that, you know, you might want to ask yourself this question. All of a sudden, that may, you know, that changes your, your experience in the present moment. And it may, in fact, get you to realize that, oh, yeah, you know, I have some real work to do with my wife or my father. Or, um, but the question is then, what do you, let's say you have that experience of a really valuable tarot card reading. You know, what, are you going to conclude about tarot cards on the uh, on the basis of that? I think you'd be wrong to conclude that this is magic. You'd be right to conclude that there's a certain value in asking questions, um, and and that it's very easy. We know this. It's very easy to to set up a system which has a, a psychological resonance for most people most of the time. This is why astrology seems to work for most people most of the time. You can give Charles Manson's astrological chart to a hundred people. And 99 of them will say, yeah, well, there's, you know, they'll think it's their chart and they think, yeah, this really does kind of get me uh, in some fundamental way uh, because there's no magic to this. Things are written with, you know, sufficient generality as to be evocative uh, uh, for everybody because we're very similar. I'm not saying that religion can't ever be useful or inspire good things. Um, it certainly can and has and, and will, and that's that's uh, better than the alternative. But there's a, there's a distinction. We have to recognize there's a distinction between something being true and something being useful. I mean, every religion, every benign religion, every religion that's actually helping somebody sometimes could be functioning like a placebo. I mean, it could be could be totally barren of content and still useful in certain circumstances. I mean, I could invent a religion right now, which we know is not true, and would be extremely useful if I could spread it to billions. Now, I invent it right now. This this re religion is, um, the principles are, do your best to love your neighbor and, you, and your family and I, every person you meet. Uh, encourage your children to study science and mathematics to the best of their abilities. Uh, and if you don't do this, you will be punished for eternity by 17 demons after death. Um, now, I have no doubt that if I could spread this to billions, this would be a better religion than the religions we've got. It would be better than Christianity and Judaism and Islam. You'd have no suicide bombers. What we, you would have is a generation of children bearing down on science and, and mathematics to the best of their abilities, encouraged by their otherwise ethical parents, um, all under the the compulsion of do this or else the 17 demons will torture you for eternity. Does this, would this, this the usefulness of this, I mean, this, we, would, we would live in a much better world, no question. Um, the usefulness of this, would this suggest for a moment that the 17 demons actually exist? Would it, would it provide a reason to believe in, in these 17 demons? Uh, not even slightly. So, that's that's the divide here. There's there's it's, there's a big difference between the utility of an idea or the consoling nature of an idea. I mean, the idea that you know God has a plan for me or everything happens for a reason. And the idea that these are consoling is quite distinct from whether there are, there are good reasons to believe them. this myth that unless you think one of your books was dictated by the creator of the universe and and there he told you what good what good and evil are you'll just have no basis for morality I mean you you, you need religion in some sense to have a, a generalizable morality without religion there's no way to say the Nazis were really wrong to, to do what they did or believe what they believe um, I think that's clearly untrue. I think we have a uh, some very serviceable intuitions about about what good and evil are and what is um, what constitutes an ethical life, and we converge on those intuitions. I mean, every culture uh, agrees that that cruelty is wrong. You know, that taking pleasure in the suffering of others is wrong within the context of your in-group. I mean, the, the, many cultures think it's good to 
take pleasure in the in the suffering of of people who are not part of your tribe,